The federal judge in Donald Trump's New York criminal case found the former president in contempt for a tenth time today. The decision is a response to the former president repeatedly violating his gag order. Judge Marchand is now threatening Trump with jail time if he continues this behavior. The former president is charged with 34 felony counts for allegedly falsifying business records to cover up an alleged affair ahead of the 2016 election. Let's bring in Katrina Kaufman and Graham Cates, who are both outside the New York uh, courthouse in Lower Manhattan. Katrina is an attorney and CBS News campaign reporter. Graham is a CBS News investigative reporter. It's so great to have you both. Katrina, let's start with you. Um, this is the 10th time Trump has been held in contempt for violating his gag order. Uh, $10,000, I'm sure, is nothing but a threat for jail time might be relevant. Um, I wonder how that's being received and, and what this all means. Hi, Lilia. So, yes, <clears throat> we're seeing a real escalation with these contempt findings. The judge is realizing that these $1,000 monetary fines are really not much of a deterrent for Donald Trump. We know that given his wealth, that's really just a very tiny fraction for him. So the judge is now saying that jail is on the table if this continues. And so far, we really haven't seen these gag order violations stopping Trump's rhetoric. If anything, he uses them to boost his fundraising. We've often seen these legal troubles boost him in the polls. And perhaps he's even daring this threat of jail, which it seems like Judge Rashawn really doesn't want to have to take that step. But I was actually reminded today of a moment in the E. Jean Carroll trial where Trump was often acting out in that courtroom in a way he doesn't do in this one, but he does outside of it. And one day, Judge Lewis Kaplan in that case was saying, you know, something to the extent of, do you want me to have to find you in contempt and put you in jail? And Trump commented, I would love that. And the judge mm. said, I know you would. Mm. And so you almost wonder if he realizes how that might rally his base if he's actually put behind bars as the trial is going on. I mean, think about the amount of fundraising that came from that mugshot. It is <clears throat> some, something that I can imagine <coughs> choking here. Something he can blow out of proportion even if, and, and perhaps say more to that narrative that he's been uh, continuing during the campaign. Graham, I want to bring you in. Um, how much uh, of this long rope would Trump have if he were not president? That's something that the judge actually talked about. He said, look, you're a former president, likely the next president, or probably or possibly. Um, it seems he says this is a witch hunt because uh, he was president and because they want to get rid of him, that it's all political. It sounds like the judge is actually saying the opposite. Look, you know, I'm, I'm, it's not a good look to put you in jail. Um, Talk to us about benefit or or not of him having been a president. You know, there's no doubt that this would be playing out differently if he wasn't a former president and a current uh, presidential contender. Uh, you Generally, when you're in a criminal trial, you can't talk about the jurors. You can't talk about other witnesses. And uh, if you continuously violate a gag order in a, in a, in a case, you're held in contempt and, and at times actually jailed. He's gotten a lot of warnings about this. The prosecutors have said at some point we may ask for that. The judge has really drawn his red line at talking about the jurors time and time again these are the things that he mentions when he finds uh, Trump in contempt it's the the times when Trump mentions jurors whether it's uh, in an interview or posting about the jury selection process on social media uh, and, and he said one of the things that I'm thinking about when I'm when I'm considering this kind of what would be a momentous decision is the toll that this would take not just on the defendant, but the court staff, the corrections officers who have to oversee it, the Secret Service uh, agents he mentioned who would have to accompany Trump. He knows that there's more that would go into this than just the normal uh, uh, jailing of a defendant. I mean, this case covering it, I'm sure for both of you, there's so much that happens around and outside and uh, even behind you as campaigns kind of happen and show up there. But let's not lose sight of the facts of the case. Katrina, what are we learning from today's testimony from Jeffrey McConney? And remind us uh, why it's relevant. So Jeff McConney is the former controller from the Trump Organization. And we're finally seeing the falsification of business records aspect of this case. Until now, we've really been seeing a larger catch-and-kill scheme laid out where they revealed this 
allegation that they were trying to suppress damaging stories from coming out about Donald Trump leading up to the election and really show their case for election fraud that was going on. But ultimately, that's actually an underlying charge here. Trump is charged with 34 counts of falsification of business records, and Jeffrey McConaughey is giving us what happened behind the scenes at the Trump Organization as these reimbursement payments were made. We're learning about conversations between him and Alan Weisselberg, who was the former chief financial officer of the Trump Organization, who directed McConaughey to make this repayment to Michael Cohen, and we learned sort of the numeric breakdown of that, as well as how McConaughey then told Deborah Tarasoff, who handled payroll at the company and who we expect to see on the witness stand at some point in this case, to mark those down as legal expenses and retainers. But what was really key is we learned that the payments had to come out of Donald Trump's personal account. Mm. So this is bringing in Trump and his own knowledge of the payments. He even detailed how they had to come up with a whole new process of sending checks from the Trump Organization to the White House so Trump could sign them himself, then back to the Trump Organization, and then to Michael Cohen. So we're really starting to see the threads of the falsification business records aspect of this case, which the prosecution does have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt here. Katrina Kaufman, Graham Cates, it's so great to have you. Thank you.